I remember the speculation period leading up to Battlefield 3's announcement. We met that announcement, the confirmation there would be another traditional Battlefield entry, with a collective sigh of relief, traditional Battlefield titles would persist. But the end product, Battlefield 3, felt like a zero-sum game. Modernizations and new toys at the expense of previous titles' collective magic, wisdom, and defining design elements. It felt like the Larry David GIF. We met the announcement of MechWarrior 5, the confirmation there would be another traditional single-player MechWarrior entry with tight sphincters. The studio, PGI, hadn't quite earned the community's trust like DICE had. The end product, MechWarrior 5, too, felt like a zero-sum game. Modernizations and new toys at the expense of previous titles' collective magic, wisdom, and defining design elements. It feels like the Larry David GIF. Like Battlefield 3, MechWarrior 5 feels far less ambitious and passionate compared to its predecessors. Although vastly more modern, the presentation, storytelling, and gameplay don't build upon the triumphs of the titles before it. Poor animations, poor attention to detail, poor storytelling, and ultimately poor game design. Everything feels somehow par or subpar, and nothing really exceeds expectations. MechWarrior 5 is a collection of good but statements, where the but outweighs the good. What isn't subpar are their environments. The skyboxes, the terrain, the fauna, the textures, and the settlements are pleasing to admire. The procedural environment generator that PGI invested in produces beautiful and fairly varied environments. The only complaint here is that there really ought to be more. The DLCs and modders seem to have addressed that for now. The sandboxes too are interactive and enjoyable. Buildings react to destruction and interactions better than before. Mechs can stomp through a three-story building, and although the grid system PGI used is pretty apparent, it works, and it works reliably. Large forests interrupt lasers and catch autocannon rounds before burning and splintering down. Rock formations and terrain elevation provide cover in varied engagement distances. The only complaint was a rather limited set of initial weather effects. A few modders have addressed that too, and I believe PGI officially adopted one of those sets of weather mods. Alex Iglesias' superb mech designs continue, but now we see them alongside VTOLs, ground vehicles, cities, dropships, and even infantry, as long as you've adopted PGI's official infantry mod. The game and Alex's work looks better in Unreal Engine, although the textures and shaders still retain far too much sheen and shine. Everything looks super wet all the time. But even that's addressable by a small mod, too. Unreal Engine presents a far prettier picture for MechWarrior, as long as they remain static. Things change once mechs start moving. The battle mech animations are rather clumsy. Inverse kinematics remain disabled by default. They were disabled in MechWarrior Online to alleviate performance concerns, an unfortunate but prudent decision to make for a free-to-play arena shooter. But MechWarrior 5 is a single-player or co-op PvE title. This is the MechWarrior entry you ought to drown players in high-quality details. This is the title worth sacrificing a few frames so that the legs match the terrain. I say disabled, not excluded, because simple mods easily restore the feature. It really ought to have been a graphic setting. The locomotion animations, like MechWarrior Online, still look like they're on roller skates. The animations also don't account for the gait cycle. Some mechs incorporate this motion to a smaller degree, but other mech locomotion animations entirely ignore this. The Centurion, the first mech that players observe, exhibits absolutely no lateral hip rotations. It is perhaps the worst offender. The battle mechs also don't exhibit separate walk and run animations. MechWarrior 4, the immediate predecessor, had superior locomotion animations, solid footing, lateral hip rotations, and separate walk and run animations that scaled with speed. The cockpit animations don't align with third person locomotion animations either. Player perceived cockpit footsteps don't align with the pace and rhythm of footsteps in third person. 
Some mechs lean while torso twisting in locomotion, but the cockpits don't reflect that. It's understandable that players might feel disoriented otherwise, but I'm of the opinion that an option should have been provided to keep the cockpits aligned with torso planes. The arm animations, though, in a small positive, do coincide with line of sight. Arms will bend and twist to match where the pilot's reticle is targeting. It's a nice touch and, I guess, proof that the team was aware of animation improvements necessary from MechWire Online. It's a shame that more effort wasn't put into the rest. The animations frustrate me, but it's not because they were done incorrectly. They weren't really invested in at all. These battle mech assets, the assets that funded 10 years of MechWire Online, and the assets fans care about, chiefly, are poorly presented in MechWarrior 5. I know there's talented, passionate, and imaginative developers out there who could and would carefully and lovingly animate these beloved assets the same way this community has carefully and lovingly painted tabletop figures for the past four years. PGI ought to have animated these beloved assets with that same passion. The cockpits, however, are presented pretty well, but they were ultimately presented in MechWarrior Online slightly better. The cockpits are still fairly intricate, lots of details, buttons, wires, and what we call greebling. The textures are low resolution, but that too is fixed by a fairly simple mod. But the cockpits still feel somehow empty and non-interactive. The MechWarrior Online cockpits had multi-function displays that, at most, would display a random GIF for, or the kill count. It was a little touch that filled the cockpit with life and inspired players to hope there would be more customizable features for them later. Radio chatter, ammunition counts and locations, and other secondary functions you don't want cluttering your HUD. It inspired players that their battle mech cockpits would feel like what Star Citizen's done with theirs. Obviously that never happened in MechWarrior 5. The MFDs were removed entirely, but the mounting points are still pretty visible. The HUD, regardless of what subjective opinions we all might hold, is missing advanced zoom, a feature in place since MechWarrior 3. It's also a feature re-implemented by mods. The HUD still isn't color customizable by default. You have to rely on a mod for that, too. I'm also of the opinion the HUD was designed for a monitor and not a neuro helmet. The rest of the interactive interiors, too, feel empty and lackluster. NPC characters stand around, but don't move. Faces are detailed, but look dated. Spaces are either empty or loosely cluttered. Lighting sources feel omitted because they were omitted. Several lighting sources were cut for console performance targets. PC players can, thankfully, restore the lighting with another relatively simple mod. The studio behind MechWarrior 5 decided upon an interactive 3D hub environment. It was a very ambitious choice. The 3D hub environments, especially in first-person settings, remain extra vulnerable to looking unfinished or empty. There's often too much space and far too many variable angles to cover where the player might find an unattractive view of the environments. It's a vulnerability that larger studios have resources to address. But PGI isn't a large studio. They're a notoriously small and self-described technical studio not a large storytelling studio like a rock star. Logically, a small technical studio ought to have committed to a traditional 2D environment storytelling medium. Logically, PGI ought to have invested in player hub environments akin to Battletech. 2D scene settings mixed in with fixed angle 3D style hub environments and cutscenes. But PGI didn't. They really committed to 3D spaces and animations. The 3D spaces, the hangar and the ready room chiefly, feel empty. It feels like PGI purchased a canvas too big for their painters to complete in time. What's too bad is that the lone, fixed-angle 3D environment, the Leopard Cockpit, feels so much truer to Battletech and so much more full of life and attention to detail. PGI's newer intro cinematic, done in-engine with in-game assets, too, feels incomplete. The paint scheme on the Centurion doesn't even match the paint scheme from the tutorial. This cutscene is supposed to immediately follow the tutorial. Fans have made better cutscenes with less time and resources. The immersion isn't here. It's stifled. 
I am constantly running into unfinished animations, empty spaces, cut content, and ugly HUD colors. The world MechWarrior 5 built isn't convincing. I don't feel like the MechWarrior I'm supposed to or would like to. I felt scared playing MechWarrior 3. I felt rather inspired playing MechWarrior 4. I felt invested playing Battletech. But I feel nothing playing through MechWarrior 5. MechWarrior 5 stifles whatever feelings or immersion I'm trying to willingly drown myself in because it largely incites doubt and sows skepticism. Would a narrow helmet HUD really look like that? Don't ballistic sable rounds produce sparks rather than clouds of explosions? Why don't tanks in real life glisten like the mechs I'm looking at? Where am I storing all of these mechs in my very tiny leopard dropship? And aren't these mechs a little too tall? Depending on who you ask, yes, I believe they're too tall. There are numerous threads on this and equally numerous graphs and sources depicting mech height. Canonically, basically, all mechs are supposed to stand between 8 to 14 meters tall. The Atlas in-game stands at 19. Mech Warrior has always struggled with scale, but that's partly because it's either a PvP arena shooter without combined arms or good reference points, such as Mech Warrior Online, or a tabletop game. But MechWarrior 5, the newest, most modern single player offering, needs to portray scale well. The inclusion of combined arms helps, but the debate still rages on. Sean Lang seems to agree. Excess scale factor of 9,000. PGI has been wrong before. Look at the MechWarrior Online catapult rescale. I'll leave Sean Lang's video on the original mod and a few reference graphics in the description for you to determine. But know this, an M1A2 Abrams tank sits in at around 70 tons, and it's not that big. Although I don't feel like the mech warrior I'm supposed to in the cockpit or around the dropship, I do certainly acknowledge that I'm in the inner sphere. Like Battletech, almost every system and planet is made available in the inner sphere. The player does have a large degree of freedom in the main campaign or through the DLC. You can be a house loyalist or a pirate or something in between. But the inner sphere that's presented feels very empty as soon as you start zooming in. Although there are regional lore descriptors, the systems themselves lack descriptors, lore, and flavor. The limited biome count means that each system or planet feels whatever is the opposite of unique is. It feels repetitive. You can't filter worlds while looking for industrial planets between industrial zones or filter out certain missions. What is fleshed out and explored in this setting, though, is done almost entirely through in-game radio chatter, which is often drowned out by war noise, or through very brief and very simple table briefs with Rihanna. The voice acting is, funnily enough, acceptable, but it still feels out of place. Spears' in-game voice, supposedly a voice transmitted light years across space, sounds like raw audio file taken from the recording booth. Recycled mercenary identification number. A new identity, essentially. Nick's Cavaliers, for all intents and purposes. I'll match that number to a new name of your choosing once the time comes. Battletech did everything here better, and probably through cheaper and more conventional means. 2D and fixed 3D environments, limited voice acting, system or planet specific details, lore and identities, interesting dialogue with crewmates, enticing environments and cutscenes that build in further character development, good writing and player choice. Battletech successfully developed player relationships and character arcs with their random crewmates and hired mech pilots through a fantastic in-travel storytelling system. Speech checks, relationship checks, and financial options were all presented to the player commander to help with the quarrels between NPCs during travel time. MechWarrior 5 has none of that. The crew is supposed to travel for weeks to months in between contracts, and there's nothing in between to help tell a story or build a world for you. The characters are boring, the story is boring, the star systems are boring. And I know, PGI aren't storytellers by trade. They are a self-proclaimed technical studio, but that doesn't excuse them from selling us a single-player focused story-based mech warrior title with such poor storytelling, environment setting, and exposition. Hire some writers or contract it out if you know you're deficient in this area of production. 
investing in writing has to take precedence over investing in empty 3D environments. I had faith in you, and that I was mistaken to think that you could execute such a simple plan. Return immediately to Xinyang, Captain. And I promise you that your punishment, though severe, will be swift. Games have been telling stories effectively through 2D animated scenes without voice acting for decades. It's the simplest form of video game storytelling. It's also probably the cheapest form. But it's ultimately all you need, and honestly, MechWarrior 5 would have upped the quality of storytelling compared to MechWarrior 4 and 3 had they stuck to conventional 2D storytelling with good writing and art assets. As it is, the story is vanilla ice cream presented naked on a paper plate. Yes, we're getting the ice cream we asked for, but that doesn't mean we can't be disappointed. There is, technically, sufficient exposition tossed in between, but it's not convincing exposition. MechWarrior 5's story falls prey to a very similar criticism thrown at Fallout 4. The player will not care about a character they don't have a prior existing relationship with. No one cared about your player child, Sean, and nobody cares about your player dad, Nikolai. We didn't know them and spent a grand total of maybe 10 minutes alongside them before they were removed. The player will not be invested in avenging or rescuing a character they haven't developed a relationship with. But the similarities between MechWarrior 5 and Fallout 4 end after that introduction. In Fallout 4, you can choose to go find your kid, or you can choose not to and explore the world around you. All systems. Nominal. Unify the settlements, nuke the settlements, save your kid, kill your kid, or anything in between. You can, in MechWarrior 5, either through campaign or career modes, entirely ignore the main story in MechWarrior 5. You can amass too many mechs for your leopard dropship and build out your mercenary company further. You can align yourself with major houses, independents, periphery houses, or just be a pirate. But it's still a very dry experience. There are smaller mini-campaigns throughout, kind of like flashpoints in Battletech, but it's still just a string of the same operations you've already played with some text-based exposition, largely provided through radio chatter in-game. You'll do a raid, demo, raid, defense, war zone, assassination, one of those combinations in a string of missions, while some house layout operative fills you in with text. There's no recourse, results, consequences, rewards, character building, or any kind of story progression of any substantial impact throughout. MechWarrior 4 Mercs, in comparison, constantly offered the player choices that provided a substantial impact. At the end of MechWarrior 4 Vengeance, you could either rescue the player's sister, or forgo rescuing the sister to seize a bunch of assault mechs in a warehouse before the final mission. There were missions in MechWarrior 4, where doing things like clearing skies in a mission beforehand would mean less air units in the rest of the operation, or assisting a rebel faction in one mission would let them ignore whatever you were doing in the rest of the operation. There was an honor path with MechWarrior 4 Mercs, depending on who you sided with. There was a whole mission on a planet called New Exford in MechWarrior 4 Mercs, where, depending on the choices made, you could either backstab the clan leader or have a big beach fight on their terms. Depending on who you sided with in MechWarrior 4 Mercs, you would also have the chance to either acquire some Templars or some Fafnirs. There were mission strings where if you kept raiding a convoy, you could ultimately lose out on the last mission because they knew you were going to be there and didn't have any resources there for you to loot. There were a lot more consequences, choices, and substantial impact on the player's campaign experience in MechWarrior 4 Mercenaries than there is in MechWarrior 5 Mercenaries. MechWarrior 5 Mercenaries really only amounts to taking a small merc company with a handful of light mechs and building it into a big merc company with a bunch of Steiner Assault Lances. It's unfortunately the same trope that every other MechWarrior title has relied on, and although MechWarrior 5 is just continuing that standard, it's still shallow, derivative, and disappointing. 
The Battletech universe, much like Fallout's, is so immensely and densely rich in diversity, character, conflicts, drama, and story. But so little of this universe is explored in MechWarrior 5, and especially now, players crave the exposition and fleshing out of this infinitely interesting setting, a setting that's finally beginning to garner near AAA levels of attention. I've now described MechWarrior 5's campaign, career, and story as dry, boring, or shallow. I want to now compare MechWarrior 5's world-building attempts between two other sci-fi world-building games to describe where exactly MechWarrior 5 lands on the greater spectrum. No Man's Sky, supposedly a much better game now, was launched in July 2018 by a relatively small studio. They leaned on a procedural generation system that produced literal billions of planets. The early criticism noted how devoid of life each planet felt. Star Citizen, supposedly still on track to launch out of Alpha in this millennia, has been in development forever by what is now an immense studio. They lean on curating a relatively small collection of star systems for now. There's only one system to explore, with a handful of planets, moons, and space stations, but each one of those environments is relatively crammed full of detail. MechWarrior 5 adheres to the former. Too many empty and lifeless locations through a procedurally generated system. I wouldn't argue that they should have adhered to the latter, but they ought to have landed somewhere in between. And I think MechWarrior 4 Mercs showcased just where that in-between could be. You could traverse the inner sphere, but only to a smaller collection of curated environments. Campaigns were presented on a big area of operations map, and operations were presented as a battle within that total map. There was a much more curated sense of place produced for the player. Each travel location felt unique, fleshed out, and provided distinct memories of the experience there. The new Exford campaign was presented to the player as a clan interdiction story on a jungle beach planet. MechWarrior 5's procedural environments are gorgeous and well produced. They're fun sandboxes to pit mechs and tanks together. They're fun settlements to siege and run through. But the contracts you accept all feel like a strung together set of randomly generated instant action games with some exposition tossed in between, maybe. The traditional and very successful placemaking tools in MechWarrior 3 and MechWarrior 4, the multiple operations within one environmental campaign, are entirely absent in MechWarrior 5. The replacement isn't sufficient enough. Yes, it is impressive to see the entirety of the Inner Sphere in game but you're never really traveling to any of those worlds. You're not seeing, interacting with, or going to remember any of your time spent on any of these systems or planets. You're not going to see a map of the planet or drone camera footage laying out what's ahead of you. You'll get atmosphere information, but no topography to use as a planning tool. And all of this undercuts the entire allure of exploring the inner sphere. The game really ought to have afforded the player more planning tools custom waypoints, spawn locations, deployable resources, etc. MechWarrior 5 takes some of the older objective designs, demolitions and raids for example, and does improve upon them with better destruction mechanics. No more spamming boxes with autocannons until it falls. The other objectives, headhunting, base defense, and warzone, are fine, if not very repetitive. Headhunting only rewards the players for killing the designated target. Theoretically, you could land a very lucky headshot from a ridge and exfiltrate. Raids only reward players for demolishing designated buildings. Theoretically, you could land a volley of LRMs from a ridge and exfiltrate. But headhunting usually always turns into a drawn-out slugfest, and raid missions don't tell you the targets you're looking for until you're almost right on top of them. Which means you'll get drawn into a slugfest looking for the buildings before you can think of anything more efficient, clever, or creative. I found myself actively avoiding demolition and raid missions in favor of defense and warzone fights both of which are very simple, and very economical, wave defense missions. The objective designs on paper seem like they would reward clever thinking. Machine guns and flamers do extra building damage, so theoretically, a lance of fast-moving firestarters jumping in or sprinting into a settlement, raising the place, and sprinting or jumping back to exfiltration ought to be a valid strategy in a demolition mission. It is in Battletech. Theoretically, a lance of griffins jumping around a settlement at range looking for sightlines to destroy certain targets of interest and then exfiltrating ought to be a valid strategy in a raid mission. It is in Battletech. 
Theoretically, a Lance of LRM mechs with a spotter ought to be able to single out and bombard an assassination target and then exfiltrate. That all should be a valid strategy in an assassination mission. It is in Battletech. But in MechWarrior 5, the only real effective strategy boils down to the trope of bring the heaviest lance you can afford. There's a modicum of variety in the strategy for defense mission. I did find that bringing the heaviest lance I can afford with ranged weapons is slightly better at base defense, but there's still very little variety overall between objectives. I tried building a jump capable cavalry lance with victors, grasshoppers, griffins, and jenners in an attempt to figure out a new objective strategy other than bring big mechs. But it didn't really work because of the lack of planning tools, deployable resources, and AI control. The fights all begin feeling the same. Your lance ends up routinely destroying battalions worth of enemies that either feel suicidal or stupid. There aren't any sub-objectives that reward the player's extra effort with extra help. There aren't any player choices in the mission to add variety or produce interesting memories. If the player had either an option to deploy some resources at a base to draw out defenders so that you could run in with that fire starter lance and raise the buildings, or the AI control to split your lance into a pair of skirmisher mechs and a pair of demolition mechs, then perhaps we'd have more unique and enjoyable experiences. But the player isn't afforded either. Planning tools are absent, the AI control is minimal, and the player isn't afforded any kind of resources aside from the lance mate that they spawn with. Battletech had missions designed exclusively to challenge the traditional strategy of bring heavier mechs. There were missions where a fast jump capable medium was the real solution. There were missions where having a light mech in your lance for scouting and interdictions was the real solution. There were so many more different solutions than bring heavier mechs. There were more solutions perhaps because there were more objective designs. MechWarrior 4 was ultimately still just a shoot tanks and mechs experience, but the missions were more curated along the way. There was writing and voice acting to give you a sense of what for. There were more types of objectives. There were really notable missions like the Raven Recon mission, the New Exford Beach Fight or the New Exford Backstab, the Honor Guard Negotiations mission, the Overlord Dropship Battle, numerous little escort missions, the Modal mission, blowing up battleships, and the Solaris 7 tournaments. MechWarrior 5 exhibits none of this variety. The staple curated mission designs we've enjoyed in traditional single-player MechWarrior titles were replaced in favor of a procedural system. The procedural system works, I've only run into one bug so far, but I'm not sure it was an improvement. The Beachhead DLC does add secondary objective components, artillery cannons that make slow assault mechs more vulnerable, but the features and choices are limited to this specific operation. It's not an improvement or feature set implemented to the rest of the missions. The procedural system, perhaps with more planning tools, deployable resources, and better AI control, could have surpassed the MechWarrior campaign mission standard. Perhaps. For now, we have modders who have designed several new types of mission designs for us to fill the gap. To be clear, Fighting other battle mechs with your battle mech remains extremely satisfying and very competent, even in these rather shallow procedural objective fights. MechWarrior 5 generally improves upon MechWarrior Online's mech mechanics, which were already very good. This is, again, the best MechWarrior has had, and is a solid iteration of improvements. Landing ballistic shots onto moving lights is still satisfying. Bursting AC2s into the air as anti-air is satisfying. Landing a melee headshot is both new and also pretty satisfying, and stomping on tanks is… it's pretty good. The additional sandbox mechanics described earlier, forests catching autocannon salvos, add to the solid MechWarrior Online mechanics too. MechWarrior 5, like MechWarrior Online, is very lucky that the act of shooting other mechs in this game is so satisfying. Even though I do have small qualms here, ballistic velocities and tracers, jump jet behavior and infantry design, I still hold this aspect of MechWarrior 5 as highly regarded. I don't want to return to MechWarrior 4 or 3 chiefly because the mechanics present in MechWarrior 5 are too good. But there are a lot of missing mechanics, some of them pretty basic. 
We don't have unlocked mech labs, which has been restored by a mod. We didn't have environmental heat effects, which was added by a mod. We didn't have dynamic thermal vision, which again was added by a mod. We never saw the MechWarrior 3 style targeting computer, which has been put in by a mod. There's no infantry elements in MechWarrior 5. It, well, actually there were. It was cut content, and there's a mod out there that PGI sponsored to <laughs> restore the cut content of infantry. Mech floodlights still aren't in there, which is accessible by a mod. Crouch still isn't available. Advanced zoom, which has been kind of a staple feature since MechWarrior 3, isn't in MechWarrior 5 until you install one of a couple of mods. And we still don't have keys to look behind you or have like a reverse backup camera. The game is still plenty playable without these features, but they are features that we miss. Everything still works, but part of MechWarrior's charm is interacting with the battle mech in every way you can. If PGI is truly the technical studio they claim to be, I'd expect battle mech feature sets to be as flushed out as possible. But no matter how many features the players can interact with, in MechWarrior 5, the AI routinely ruins a significant amount of the player experience. MechWarrior entries have never been known for great artificial intelligence. Most entries turn into arcade shooting galleries. I recall that MechWarrior 3's mech AI would, at best, run up to you, turn around, run away, and repeat. I'll be honest, I struggle to include the MechWarrior 5 AI as a criticism simply because of how low the standards have been set by the title's predecessors. But both prior titles had positives surrounding that subpar AI that made up for it. MechWarrior 3 made up for it with its incredible techno-spooky vibe. MechWarrior 4 had a plethora of created mission operations that in a way kind of hid the poor AI from the player, either with scripting or just sheer variety. But MechWarrior 5 doesn't have incredible vibes or curated mission operations. It has some agreeable rock and roll and procedurally generated missions on a beautiful but ultimately disposable map. It's hard to accept PGI's identification as a technical studio after experiencing their initial AI investment at launch. The actual battles in MechWarrior 5 feel repetitive, largely because the enemy AI relies on only a few tactics and behaviors, Usually, waves of mechs in your face ad nauseum. Think of that scene from Return of the Jedi where waves of TIE fighters washed over the Millennium Falcon's cockpit. It feels a little bit like that. All fights boil down to either a circle strafe mosh pit, and it's kind of been that way forever. But I was hoping MechWarrior 5 would be the new standard bearer. If the studio wasn't or couldn't focus on presentation and storytelling, Surely they had invested in making sure each battle was engaging, challenging, and different. Battles with tactics like range kiting, pop tarting, hunter killer, flanking and backstabbing, hull down, ECM bubbles, shutdown ambushes, or hit and runs and circle strafing. In reality, it's really only the last two on that list. In the base game, the strategy is spawn in waves out of sight, rush in, and circle strafe. You are constantly in a situation where your lance has to burn through several other lances of opposition forces. It never feels like a more clever application of your resources against theirs. It always feels like a total shooting gallery, just like the older MechWarrior titles. But even MechWarrior 4 had the occasional Pop-Tart Shadowcat programmed into a mission. The Lance Command options, too, don't add variety to the experiences. The most you can really do is tell them to focus their fire on your target. There aren't options to hold position and fire, jump to a location, and other familiar tactics traditionally present in other mech warrior, mech commander, or battletech tactics. I've always wanted my catapult or blackjack to hold a position on a ridge and lob fire support my way. I've always wanted to send a light mech to a point in the map, but I can't unless I have line of sight. What happened in the mech warrior 3 system? What happened in the mech warrior online map? What's especially frustrating is that you have so little control of your AI lance mates, you end up having to do everything yourself. You can't effectively place a catapult with LRMs on a hill to support your brawls. You can't tell a lance mate to sprint into a town, run into the buildings, and then sprint out. You can't tell a Jaeger mech with AC2s to prioritize air units for you. You can't get your lance to walk backwards from a fight to a point in the map. You can't split your lance into two units and do some kind of pincer maneuver. You can't tell a lance mate to jump jet to a certain position. It's evident that the player challenge is not offered through clever AI or objective designs. It's offered through quantity, and that quantity being the only offering afforded means that every experience kind of blends into one another. The DLCs and modders seem to have addressed that for now. 
A few modders have addressed that too, and I believe PGI officially adopted one of those sets of weather mods, as long as you've adopted PGI's official infantry mod. But even that's addressable by a small mod too, because simple mods easily restore the feature. PC players can, thankfully, restore the lighting with another relatively simple mod. I'll leave Sean Lang's video on the original mod and a few reference graphics in the description for you to determine. For now, we have modders who've designed several new types of mission designs for us to fill the gap. We don't have unlocked mech labs, which has been restored by a mod. We didn't have environmental heat effects, which was added by a mod. We didn't have dynamic thermal vision, which again was added by a mod. We never saw the MechWarrior 3 style targeting computer, which has been put in by a mod. Until you deploy what is, perhaps, the game's most important and most valuable mod, TT Rules AI Mod 2, the game's AI remains incredibly limited, especially considering the technical studio branding of PGI. Unless you have three other friends interested in playing MechWarrior 5's campaign or career mode alongside you, be prepared for an incredibly limited gameplay experience. This game was fixed, fleshed out, and finished by modders. It was released in December of 2019 in what many called a highly polished alpha state. To date, it's seen several patches, DLCs, and mods, but the mods released have contributed the most to the game's overall health. I can't speak to how easy it has been to mod MechWarrior on 5, but there are official modding tools released by PGI, and it is a game on Unreal Engine. It has to be easier to work on than CryEngine. And installing the mods manually has become a very easy process drop the files into a mod folder. And there are other options too. Steam Workshop and Epic Games both have a medium for mod installation. It's not as complete or vast as the Nexus, but it is worth commending the multiple choice ecosystem built out for us. But it's also worth criticizing how PGI has ultimately broken that same ecosystem. There was an immense modding effort at the release and these early mods were substantial. They either fixed bugs, added new effects, restored cut content, installed missing mechanics, or overhauled the game's spawning systems, mech labs, and enemy slash friendly AI. Navita 1 is perhaps the title's most prolific modder. One could make a solid argument that he finished PGI's game and deserves a credit line at the end. His mods restored inverse kinematics, fixed some projectile trails, produced a 3D neuro helmet HUD and restored the missing advanced zoom feature, produced the volumetric rescale for mechs and tanks I was talking about earlier, and also the MechWarrior 5 Mercs Reloaded mod. Mercs Reloaded was a comprehensive conglomerate of features and changes. It, by itself, restored the Mech Lab to MechWarrior Online levels, installed environmental heat effects, modified thermal vision, restored the MechWarrior 3 style targeting computer, added new turret types, forced leg mechs to limp, which is what I believe a more accurate depiction of what should happen, and even fixed one of the mech's animations. It's one of the most endorsed and downloaded mods available, and it's been broken since DLC 1. Whatever updates PGI installed with the first DLC rollout necessitated an entire rewrite of Navita 1's mod and others. That's where this depiction of the game being at release a very highly polished alpha came from. The updates since haven't just been more goodies and gravy. The updates have been very in-depth development passes. I can survive without Mercs Reloaded, but there are two other mods I can't play without. TT Rules AI Mod 2, Better Spawns, and a third superfluous mod, ADC Ballistics. ADC Ballistics is a stylistic change. It more accurately portrays how modern non-chemical round ballistic systems look. The tracers are much slimmer and they spark upon impact, not balloon into a big cloud of smoke. Modern day chemical and high explosive based cannon rounds do actually produce those plumes of smoke, but I believe MechWarrior Online and MechWarrior 5 render ballistic uh, rounds as APF SDS darts. If you play MechWarrior Online and uh, kind of stare at the ballistics on like a cataphract, you'll see the dart render. Those darts spark upon impact. At the end of the day, the change is really about the tracer rendering changes and is ultimately entirely unnecessary. The other two, AI Mod 2 and Butter Spawns, are entirely necessary. Both are substantial overhauls to how MechWarrior 5 handles NPC AI and enemy spawns. It's extensive. It's the mod that changes how enemies behave and how well you can control your lance mates. Two of my strongest criticisms of MechWarrior 5 are improved substantially through a pair of mods. 
Not patches or developer updates, mods. I don't really always have the words necessary to describe how game-changing the AI mod has been, and I fear that whatever patch or DLC comes out next will break it. The Better Enemy Spawns is game-changing too, but simpler in scope, and therefore I do have easily and readily available the words necessary to describe how so. The vanilla game's spawning behavior is, essentially, insta-spawn enemy groups out of the player's camera, 500 to 1.5 kilometers away in a big flat place. VTOLs spawn in about 2.5 kilometers away. This mod pushes the VTOL spawn to 3 kilometers away and now in groups, increases dropship deployments of ground units, including tanks, decreases the traditional out-of-sight spawns and pushes them to at minimum 3 kilometers away, but keeps pre-spawn units upon map or mission loading, and also calls a bunch of unnecessary CPU processes, resulting in some increased frame rates. The mod is a game changer. No longer will enemies zombie swarm behind you. The feeling of they came out of nowhere is entirely true because they used to come out of nowhere. Now enemies will spawn farther away and make their way to your territory or drop in via dropship. Each dropship wave is interesting, you don't know what's going to come out of it. There's a fun discovery period where you observe what drops out and how you think you'll engage them. It's less so reactive and more so a mix of proactive and reactive gameplay. It's a massively positive change. It produces a much fairer challenge for players and produces a more optimized game and produces better world building. I know one weather mod was functionally adopted by PGI. Why hasn't this? The other mod, TT Rules AI Mod 2, has, in itself, seen some updates since the initial release. It, like Better Spawns, has survived the MechWarrior 5 DLC code changes. The vanilla game strategy for challenging players is, as I said earlier, based upon sheer quantity. Enemy AI are numerous, which is why you feel like you've committed genocide every mission or are just playing a tech demo, and stupid. The vanilla game severely undercut enemy AI targeting and accuracy so that you could take on literal armies every mission. They've been restored to tabletop values now, which is an across-the-board increase in enemy AI accuracy. Enemies, though, will now hide, run away, or keep fighting at critical health. They'll also seek cover if they've taken too much damage in a short time. Enemies now sort themselves into lances and behave differently based on their makeup. Some will fight at distances, some will flank, some will charge. Mechs with fists will melee much more often than mechs with just lower actuators. And the last change was roll behavior. Roll behavior is extensive, and I'm going to lump several changes under this term. I won't read word for word the roles assigned, but here's a summary from the mod page. Essentially, mechs will play much more closely to their strengths. Riflemen's riflemen and Jaeger mechs will fight you at range. Hunchbacks will close in on you. Lights and fast mediums will constantly flank or backstab you and then run away. This is one I've been aware of the most. Every fight is drastically different, and it's so much more than just the inevitable circle strafe. And those roles and behavior changes apply to your lands, too. It grants the player several layers of additional control over friendly AI. You can switch your Jaeger mech from anti-aircraft to face tanking if need be. Lance mates will even jump off cliffs to follow you or stick to a tight formation if you're running through a city. It also allows you to do things like form a firing line on a hill. This mod alone solves a lot of the game's deficiencies. And both mods, Better Spawns and TT Rules AI Mod 2, still work after the last DLC patch. My first attempt at modding the game resulted in this list. What this list doesn't show you are the several mods post-DLC break that absolutely borked my game install and necessitated a full re-download after several hours of troubleshooting and forum browsing. And was it worth it? ADC, Ballistics, Better Spawns, and TT Rules AI Mod 2 alone make it worth it for me. But the other mods have either restored cut content, fixed the game, fleshed it out, or added missing features absent from the vanilla title. 
It's frustrating playing the base game, discovering all the missing features. It's frustrating knowing that modders have reinstalled or corrected those features. It's frustrating learning how to mod the game, even though it is ultimately pretty easy. But it's frustrating because of the ecosystem, which is broken. It's frustrating relying on modders to fix the game. It's disappointing that so many of the features absent in MechWarrior Online are still absent in MechWarrior 5. It's disappointing that modders, unpaid, uncompensated, unacknowledged fans are again jumping in to flesh the game out. This community, divided in preferences it may be, still genuinely cares. The franchise could be so much more and the fans are salivating for it. They're ready to spend money, time, and energy investing into it. I spoke about MechWarrior Online monetization schemes in my prior video, and I still believe that offering a compensated community creator system is smart. There's real talent and passion in this community, and they should be compensated and adopted into the development process. I think it's a mutually beneficial arrangement that really ought to be started. We have modders now not only adding flavor and features, but fleshing out fixing and finishing this game for us. It's because we have these modders not only now adding flavor and features, but now fleshing out, fixing and finishing this game, that I've begun to consider the cash grab argument with more validity. For those unaware, many argued that MechWarrior Online felt more like a cash grab and less like an investment. The game's steady stream of purchasable and presumably profitable battle mech releases alongside eight plus years of stagnated game development led many to conclude that the studio viewed the intellectual property as nothing more than a cash grab opportunity. It's an argument against MechWarrior Online that I never really bought into. It's an argument against MechWarrior 5 that I'm now considering. The game was shipped after a delay in what still felt like a minimum viable product state. I have to assume that the studio's investments into procedural systems and porting the existing assets into Unreal Engine consumed most of the studio's time and resources. The remaining components of MechWarrior 5, the writing, world building, animation, and mechanics, all feel neglected. The result feels more so like a tech demonstration competent, if incomplete, sets of mech mechanics displayed on a set of competent, if lifeless, sets of procedurally generated environments. This tech demonstration feels more like an accommodation to fans clamoring for a modern PvE mech warrior experience, a game full of bots for players to enact their juvenile Steiner Assault Lance fantasies. Had they sold us that tech demonstration for a third or a half of the price, this review would feel different, but they sold us a fully priced launch title and continue to sell us fully priced DLC installments. They've sold us a fully priced PvE accommodation with what feels like a superficial layer of story blanketed on top. The tech demo layer beneath it has to be awe-inspiring for this package to work at those prices. But the tech demo layer isn't awe-inspiring. Competent in many ways, missing various features, but competent, but also not awe-inspiring. The list of missing features, mechanics, toys, and other wishlist items remains long. Had we received the features from both the prior titles and features not yet seen before, and the fleshed-out AI designs required in a single-player title, we could write our own stories and produce our own experiences to make up for whatever artistic elements are missing. But we didn't receive that level of support from the studio. It came from the modders after the fact. And the modders have come so close to closing that feature set and AI design gap so prevalent in MechWarrior 5. The mods released have tackled far more pressing deficiencies than the DLC updates released by the game's own studio. TT Rules AI Mod 2 and Better Spawns themselves 
Both should have been updates provided natively by the game developers, not by uncompensated fans. At the very least, the studio could have released updates that don't render moot all of the substantive and passionate progress made by these modders and modding teams. Those studio releases, the DLC, have to be extraordinarily good to outweigh the destruction they brought onto the mods, mods like MechWarrior 5 Reloaded, that have contributed far more to the game's allure than anything offered by the studio's DLC efforts since. The studio's DLC releases, unfortunately, aren't extraordinarily good. To be fair, they have given everyone free and useful updates, Lancemate switching upon death, mech melee, and some supporting star map and UI updates. But the core content hasn't proved to be exceptional value. Heroes of the Inner Sphere's beachfront game mode assets are limited to the beachfront game mode. Nothing transfers over to the regular game modes. The career mode feels exactly the same as the story mode, with strings of randomly generated instant action missions with bill paying in between. The cantina quirk feature looks too similar to the MechWarrior Online skill tree debauchery. The additional map zones, too, feel just as lifeless and shallow and repetitive as the rest. There are also mods out there accomplishing the same goal of additional biomes for free. The new weapons and equipment, too, aren't interesting enough to warrant paying for, and most of the items introduced were already available to players in MechWarrior Online, now locked behind a paywall. Legend of the Kestrel Lancers attempts to tell a more curated story. It leads with an objective of crippling the Capellan Confederation's military industrial complex, primarily through taking Capellan's stronghold worlds. It doesn't tell the players any reason why these factions are fighting. Existing fans can fill in the blanks, but good storytelling nullifies the need to fill in the blanks. This is more so a personal gripe, but I'm tired of Battletech games and stories featuring the Federated Sons as the, I won't say good guys, but the protagonists. This story premise doesn't try anything new. Battletech did. The contracts look and act exactly the same. You still set your rates, shares, and insurance. You drop from a Leopard dropship just the same, and receive the story almost explicitly through a man on the radio or post-mission readables. They also didn't add anything new for players to experiment with. We still don't have any armor, air, artillery, or reconnaissance tools, or any kind of player choices in any of the matters. It's all largely the same from what we've experienced in the base game. The third DLC, Call to Arms, looks to be the most honest DLC. It's a fully-fledged melee weapon integration that should be enjoyed and applauded. But we're still seeing mech chassis that we already had for free in MechWarrior Online now being locked behind a paywall in MechWarrior 5. But even after considering the DLC contents, MechWarrior 5 still feels like an accommodation. It should feel like art. MechWarrior 5 ultimately fails to elicit emotional investment and movement. The only investments I made were towards fixing and fleshing out the game through mods. The characters exhibit little depth and demonstrate little growth. The player actions produce little felt consequences, and the story's stakes feel light. MechWarrior 3 and 4 had a larger variety of missions. As an example, I don't think there's a single MechWarrior 5 mission where you can attempt to take down a dropship. The limited player tools and AI control inhibit player creativity. It all boils down to bring the heaviest lance you can afford, destroy waves of dumb AI, and then pay bills. Other titles for the same launch price have accomplished more. The Witcher 3 and Fallout 4 tell better stories with fully fleshed out game mechanics and a laundry list of player tools and features. The modding support in those titles are cherries on the top. Both of these titles are saturated with good storytelling, in Fallout 4's case, good storytelling outside the main story, but good storytelling elements, passion, imagination, and most importantly, direction. Battletech, essentially the turn-based strategy of MechWarrior 5 for those new to the franchises, set out with the same goals, and accomplished them far better and charged us $20 less at launch. Battletech's attempt looks much like MechWarrior 5's. Procedurally generated non-story maps, a large swath of the inner sphere to explore, 
business operations to manage, and full-length stories to tell. The procedurally generated content is about the same in quality. Both titles have high quality and beautiful environments generated by their systems. But the inner sphere presented in Battletech is richer. Rather than each region receiving descriptors, resources, and lore, each planet receives descriptors, resources, and lore. The business operations in Battletech 2 are richer. You can invest into people and dropships and the operations conducted within the dropships, and you can receive and reap tangible benefits. The story is richer and told in a far richer means. Battletech's story revolves around revenge and reclamation, similar to MechWarrior 5's premise, but the difference is that your mercenary unit is observing the character who is pursuing revenge. You, the player, have the choice to either buy into Kamea's intentions or remain skeptical. You, the player, can follow along for money or follow along for glory. You, the player, are afforded the opportunity to generate your own backstory with tangible outcomes associated with it. The game isn't trying to force the player into a certain story or set of attitudes. The game successfully immerses the player into an observer-decider role and doesn't force the player character to feel a certain way. The story premise also explores a larger and different breadth of intersphere politics, drama, and character without resorting to the tired storytelling trope of House Davion Save All. Battletech attempts to tell a new story of periphery states who traditionally don't see a whole lot of attention. And the story told is through cheaper and more conventional two-dimensional and fixed 3D means. And although the gameplay is different, this is a turn-based version of MechWarrior, it's richer, with more variety, room for creativity, and most if not all of the pertinent mechanics available to the player. Battletech demonstrated a game with passion and direction. Hairbrained schemes clearly knew what kind of story they wanted to tell, and how to best tell it. MechWarrior 5 demonstrated a game trying to justify a full price tag with a minimally viable storytelling layer. Even on sale, MechWarrior 5 is a hard sell. The player neither has the freedoms to explore and create during combat, the incentives or options to min-max their mercenary combat, nor the hook of a good story and well-written characters to continue playing. What's left feels like a cash grab, the first modern single-player mech warrior title in 17 years, and it doesn't even match the standard set in the prior two titles in the series. The prior two titles are old enough that running them on a modern system, particularly through Windows 10, is difficult. CD-ROM installations no longer work, and you have to rely on modding efforts like MechTech or the MechWarrior Quadrology, which shows up as a virus in Microsoft's defense systems, to run. Even then, my MechWarrior 3 install remains glitchy and relatively unstable. So we're stuck with MechWarrior 5, and to be honest, the mech mechanics in MechWarrior 5, even in base form and missing plenty of mechanics told earlier, they're still too good to walk away from completely. I crave the atmosphere, variety, and settings of MechWarrior 3 and 4 but it is hard to go back to their very old and clunky mechanics. But I also hesitate to boot up MechWarrior 5 again. It's hard to be excited about a game where you know the experiences you're walking into. You'll know you'll boot up a game, take a contract, load your heaviest mechs, and bludgeon your way through waves of dumb AI, occasionally destroying some buildings. But you'll never hunt and destroy a dropship, escort convoys, rescue personnel, compete in gladiatorial arenas on Solaris, plan an invasion, chase down bounties, hot drop from the atmosphere, build a base of operations, buy new dropships, fight in underground tunnels, jump jet across mountains as a lance, make players' choices, explore certain planets. MechWarrior 5 had the chance to be what MechWarrior 3 and MechWarrior 4 were, and more. It had an opportunity to tell new stories from the inner sphere. It had the opportunity to advance the MechWarrior series, PGI either attempted and missed, or decided to ship the bare minimum. Whereas 2018's Battletech advanced the series and the franchise, MechWarrior 5 failed to meet the prior benchmarks. Where I was routinely excited to come home from work and progress through Battletech's content, 
I was routinely bored while trying to slog through MechWarrior 5s. That is not to say that games with minimal or poor storytelling cannot be good. They can. But the game needs to offer players an abundance of control, mechanics, tools, and features so they may create their own stories. MechWarrior 5, without third-party mod support, and arguably with third-party mod support, struggles to offer players the same control, mechanics, tools, and features present in prior titles. With third-party mod support, it comes very close, but that upgrade is entirely dependent on whether or not PGI's own updates destroyed the existing mod library. What's left is a relatively boring, passionless, directionless action shooter still missing several important elements from its predecessors, all operating in an unstable supporting environment where the progress and efforts made by the community and consumers are routinely wiped out. There's an arcade near me that actually has an old MechWarrior 4 arcade pod. It sat on not necessarily a gyro, but a motion simulator and moved about like a mech. The game mode was essentially a Thor in third person playing wave defense. Each mech was treated with a one-hit kill rule, and you'd run around spamming the one grouping of medium lasers and UAC-5 mounts. It wasn't a very clever or interesting environment, and it did rely entirely on quantities of enemies to provide a challenge. It was really the motion simulator gimmick that made it a lot of fun. And that's what I think of the most often when I'm playing MechWarrior 5. I feel more like I'm playing on an arcade machine playing over the same random levels. I wanted more. Games with poor stories, but an abundance of tools and control can be great. Games with a deficit of tools and controls, but good storytelling too, can be great. MechWarrior 5, unfortunately, is a fully priced title with poor storytelling and a deficit of tools and controls.